So, Zach, did you ever build a really good relationship with a prison officer? Yeah, there was one in 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 High Point, in Unit Four. Big up yourself, the cool officer. We all know who you are. He was cool. He was able to chat to everyone, and we got on quite well. So yeah. Oh. What about you? Um. Yeah, I did. He worked in the gym, and he was the best egg in the world. And he knows who he is. So, big up yeah. yourself. Big up yourself. Hello and welcome back to Life After Prison, The Sit Down. Yeah, this is a podcast where we are joined by a different guest each show um, that usually talks about their journey of life after prison. But today we have the chief executive of HMPPS, Amy Reese. Hello. 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 Good morning. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good, good. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here. So thank you. It's lovely to be here um, with the pink cushions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're quite they're good, aren't they? Um, so Amy, can you just explain um, what HMPPS means? So yeah, what your role is um, and what you do day to day? Yeah, of course. So HMPPS stands for His Majesty's Prison and Probation Service. So that basically means I'm in charge of an organisation that looks after everyone in prison, everyone out on probation, any children that we lock up in custody under the youth custody services and obviously all our staff. We've got about 58,000 staff. Wow. It's a big role. <laughs> it's, it keeps me busy. Yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised. How long have you had the role for now? I've had the role since the 1st of September last year. Okay, how's it going? <laughs> well, it is a big job and there's lots to do, but I find something to make me proud every single day about what our organisation does, what it achieves, but there are lots of challenges that we also need to work through. Um, yeah, that, 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 is a, that is a busy, a busy role. Yeah. Um, Since you're like, so you're, you're the chief, you're the top, at the top, how, how um, close to the frontline services are you? How much do you know of what actually happens day so to day? Look, that is a really good question. And I know that uh, because we chatted off air, you know that my background is operational. So I governed Brixton, uh, one of the best jobs I ever had in my career. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. Um, Phil Koppel, who's also the other director general in the service, also governed lots of establishments. So that's a long way of saying I've come up through an operational route and I've been in charge of operations all through my career. So I've done a lot of being in charge of operations in Wales, prisons and probation. Um, Obviously, my day-to-day job is now not in a prison. It's uh, kind of uh, managing at a different level. So I have to work really hard at making sure I am really connected to what goes on in the front line. And I do that in lots of different ways. There's lots of people who give me reports, chief inspector, uh, chief inspectors, the IMB, uh, PPOs. There are lots of kind of external people who have a look at what we do and they feed that back to us all the time. But also, I really try to keep in very good touch with the staff. So I do about four phone calls a week to either heads of PDUs, so that's probation delivery units or okay. governing governors, and they tell me what it's like from their perspective, okay. what's working, what isn't working for them, what they feel hopeful about, what they're more concerned about. Um, and then I have lots of opportunities to speak directly to staff, either on visits when I go out and about with people, or staff do write to me quite a lot. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Quite a few connections. There. Yeah. Okay. How that, do you how do you split your time between probation and prison? Because that, yeah, we've already said it's a busy role. How how do you divide that time? Yeah, and and there's also children, so the youth custody service as well. So look, I mean, what I do is we try to have kind of governance processes for the whole thing, and that's where we bring all the business together: prisons, probation, uh, and YCS. There are lots of challenges at the same. So, for example, one of our massive challenges at the moment is getting and recruiting staff and then training them. And whilst it's a bit different, depending on where the staff are ultimately going to end up working, really the challenge is the same across the board. Then there are some challenges that are really unique uh, to each organisation. But each bit, prisons, probation and YCS has their own professional head. So we have a chief probation officer, Kim Thornton Edwards, for probation. We have uh, Phil Coppel, who sits over all the ops. Then we have Michelle Jarman Howe, who's the equivalent of Kim for prisons. So okay. she she really concentrates on prisons. And a guy called Ed Cormell, who does YCS. So that's a long way of saying I've got lots of brilliant people who also help me do my job. And they look across all the bits. But that is, I guess, the challenge of my job is that I try and look at all these things all the time and try and keep all of the plates spinning. But yeah. 
I mean, just going back a minute, even when I was in Brixton, my job was very much involved in probation. So it wasn't like being in a prison meant I wasn't very involved in probation. I had a huge role involvement in probation because it was so important to life after prison. So you had you had a decent amount of knowledge, of course, for both fields in order to like... So do you feel like that experiences are what make you like the right person for this job then? So look, first of all, the job is huge. So I would never say the job is just done by me. The job is done by every brilliant person from prison and probation officers, OSGs on the gate, case admin, right up to and including me, plus ministers, plus my boss, you know, we're all trying to do the right things all the time. So it's not a job that can be done by itself. But I think if your question is, has my experience helped me really identify with the front line? I think it does, because when ministers are thinking of a policy, I don't really think about it in policy terms. I think about how would this work in Brixton? Yeah. How would this work in the probation officer in, in Cumbran, you know, my, my frame of reference is to always go back to think about how will this work out there on the front line. I like that. I think people appreciate hearing that as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, so like, you know, with your work in, in, in Brixton, I just wanted to ask you, like, do you feel like um, what you do now can really affect the changes that happen and the things that happen like in HMP? So look, it's a brilliant question. And as I've said lots of times today, you need other brilliant people. So you still need the brilliant governor of Brixton, all the staff in Brixton. But what I try to do is make policy changes that hopefully will make their life a bit better or a bit easier or help them with problems that you can't help at that level. So for example, recruiting and retaining staff is really a job that is done nationally, where we set wages, you know, all those sorts of things they're done from the centre. So what we try and do is enable people, I guess, to do the best work they can do. But the work that's really done to change people's lives is done in that probation office in Cumbran and it is done in Brixton Prison and all the places like it across England and Wales. I agree, I agree. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we both agree it, it does happen where it, where it is. Um, so what is what is the training process of people becoming a prison officer um, and actually, you know, making sure that that is done in the prison or at probation that, you know, those relationships are built and, and the people are doing, doing, yeah, doing what they need to do. So I think the first thing to say is there's kind of the classical learning bit, the training bit, if you like, that's done. But then, as I'm sure everyone will appreciate, there's the learning that's done on the job and that's done with experience mm -hmm. and done from doing the job because being a prison officer or a probation officer is a really unique role in my view. It's a big challenge, but a massive privilege to do either of those jobs. So there's formal training and I'll talk you through that in a minute, but then there's just a lot of le learning your craft, learning your profession that takes time. Uh, and, you know, one of the wonderful things about my job is I still say every day is a school day. You know, I literally learn something new every single day. So, so um, back to your question. We have been running for the last two years an NVQ, so a national vocation qualification to be a prison officer. So they come in, they do a formal learning stint, then they go back to their establishment, do some more, then they twice go back to do more what we would call formal training. And then like a lot of NVQs, you kind of have a continuous assessment and you do an exam at the end. We are reviewing that at the moment because we try all the time to get the best balance between formal classroom learning, learning out on the job, people understanding what it's like to be in a very unique environment of a prison. And also these days we're recruiting a lot of different diverse people, which we're delighted about. But that means like being away from home for eight weeks for some people is very difficult if you've already got children or caring responsibilities. So we're looking at all the time to try and learn and get the balance right of how to train people in the best way. But I also come back to a lot of the learning is not done in a classroom. It's done being back in the landings or back in the office. I, I, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with learning on the job. I think that's with a lot of things, a lot of jobs. Um, are the prison officers um, trained for um, to deal with people and their emotions? So like trauma, um, trauma informed, are they actually trained in that area? Yep. So we do a lot of work to try and prepare people for the environment they're going to come in, as I'm sure you'll appreciate. We do sadly still have suicide, self-harm, violence. These are things that, you know, uh, uh, not the only profession, but a lot of people don't deal with mm -hmm. in their working life. And so we try and equip people as best we can for that, both in the training, to your point, 
but also afterwards. So we try and do a lot of employee support and employee insistence. But again, I wouldn't want to say to you, we've got that completely yeah. right. We should always be learning. We should always be trying to do more to equip staff as best they can to help people. How much of the training process is, you know, kind of, is the trauma involvement um involved how much of it is is that i can't get my words out sorry so it's all modules so you know we have modules that do different things so they might do security training you know the basic kind of security training what an sir is so that's a security incident report yeah. you know mm-hmm. the, the technical things locking doors or whatever and then we do a lot of you know trying to train people in getting the most of conversations and helping people to rehabilitate so something called a five minute intervention is one of the things that we talk about quite a lot and trauma informed so just for example, we've been working in South Wales Police with the prisons in South Wales mm-hmm. to try and do trauma informed right across the justice system. So not just uh, prison officers and not just police officers, but for everyone that might encounter um, offenders on their journey and understanding the trauma that's involved. And we do that as separate additional courses as well as basic training, because obviously you appreciate there's people who've been in the job a long time as yeah. well. And uh, the concept of trauma informed is re- relatively recent uh, in the last five years. I would say it's something that we've really talked about right across the criminal justice system. So is it trauma from the perspective of what the officer can face during the job and also what the, the people in the system face as well? Exactly. So I think it, it, it is, it, it's an awareness of trauma, which affects both those things. Okay. So I think what we're really trying to teach people is that people's trauma and past experiences will really affect the way they turn up, will really affect the way they react to a situation. So, you know, can you go behind your door now? A huge flare up that you might not be anticipating, but then maybe if you understand that person's background, yes. you might have understand what the trigger was. So it's that. But we are also really trying to help people to recognise the trauma that they might experience as staff or encounter in those situations and recognising it and knowing where you can go for help. So so much of it is understanding that you might be struggling and where you can go and get help or recognising that someone else, staff or prisoner might be struggling. Are officers encouraged to do, to, do that, to do that as well? To like, you know, talk about maybe I'm struggling here or for example, you know, we I don't know if this is your experience too, but from my time in a lot of uh, prison officers, maybe I've come from the army, maybe an active in, you know, in duty and sometimes that affects them. Like do you encourage officers to speak about it? We really do encourage people. And, you know, as I think you've rightly uh, sort of put your finger on, it really depends on the individual as to how open they are to talk yeah. about these things. So, you know, I don't want to stereotype, but I think it's something that younger, the younger generation have grown up more with more the concept of talking about your feelings. So some of our younger officers are, are more willing to do that. There are some kind of gender views about, you know, men don't talk about their feelings, yeah, women do. That yeah, so we're trying to encourage people all the time. But what I would say to you is it feels to me, this is not scientific, it's just the way I feel, that COVID has helped people talk a bit more about how they feel and, you know, the difficulties they might be experiencing and the effect that home life can have on your work life. Uh, and that you know, some of the relationships between the people that we look after, either in prison or in probation, has got stronger because of some of that COVID experience. I think like, you know, the relationship of um, a prisoner um, and an officer, same for probation, um, is, is, is massive. So, you know, when when things aren't going great inside, um, it, it's, it's a lot to do with just that relationship and, and not understanding. So I think that's a, a massive 100%. thing. Why we wanted to, to, to ask you about that is because we've always thought that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a really big, um, it's really important. Um, how, how do you balance, um, prison, prisoners welfare and officer safety? Because, you know, there must be some kind of, um, uh, yeah, there has to be a bit of give and take, right? Just before I answer that question, can I just go back to your point that you, you made just before about, um, you know, the relationship being so important yeah. because, you know, I think what we've talked about a lot already in this podcast is there's the kind of theory and then there's the reality of doing yeah. the job. But every bit of academic theory tells us the single most important thing for desistance, the single most important thing to stop someone offending is a meaningful relationship. It doesn't have to be with a prison officer or a probation officer. True. It could be a family member, but it equally can often be a professional of some sort We really know that. And I know from anecdotal stories how many people will point to their probation officer or a prison officer that 
they say will have saved their life in some way because they intervened in a moment where it was massive for them. We've had that on this podcast before as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've I, one of the most precious things from my career is a letter someone wrote to me, you know, an offender about how their experience had changed them. And, you know, for all the difficult days, that's, that's what makes this job worth it. Genuinely knowing that I've got staff out there who are helping to save people's lives. So I just, I guess I just wanted to convey to you how important we understand the importance of that, but there's more we need to do to build that in. So I think what you're getting at really is how much do you build it into the DNA of the organization that, that these relationships matter? And, and I think it is built on, but we're trying to build on that massively. So I'm really trying to say in my job as CEO, look, my whole job is to help people on the front line. And the whole job of the people on the front line is to help other people, is to help offenders, is to do two things straightforwardly, is to protect the public and reduce reoffending. And that's what we're all about. So we get it. We know the meanings of it. There's great examples of it every day, but there is more to do to build it into being the central plank of everything we do. Back, back to your question. I actually don't think there is a tension between uh, prisoners' welfare and staff welfare. And that's because the safest way to run our establishments is with good relationships. And the safest way to have good relationships is to make sure that everyone is looking after welfare and there's a mutually respectful relationship. And so the more that uh, prisoners feel that their welfare is being looked after, the less risk there is to any member of my staff on the yeah. landing. Straightforwardly. I mean, to be fair, it's I didn't know that that was, the, uh, having a good relationship was something that, you know, prison officers or probation stand for. So mm. hearing you say that now is it's it's a really nice feeling. And also how you're saying, you know, embedding it in the DNA. Um I think that's I crucial. Think, yeah, that that is crucial. And I'm not gonna say that that that's obviously not an easy and quick process because of the way you're saying it. Um but yeah just to just to say that I think it's crucial. Um definitely and yeah. like you said you you touched the point, you know, about the bang up asking someone to go behind the doors. It's certain a little thing in that kind of in that environment, a little thing can just make it a huge incident for out of nothing. But it's just because of the situation and where the people are. And I feel like having a good relationship makes a difference. I also you know? I also think, you know, we when you're inside, you don't believe that, that that's the case, that, you know, they care about the relationship and they understand you know, what could be going on in our heads. So I think that's another reason why it's just really great to hear you say it because, um, yeah, to, to, to help people understand that that is the case. What yeah. is the inf influence or the input from lived experience um, in regards to the training process? So look, I'm really glad you asked me this question because I would say lived experience is one of the biggest changes in the last three or four years in terms of us recognising just how important it is. So a few things. We now have a lived experience strategy, which to be clear, is only a document on paper, but it does mean that we're committed to it and we're doing things. So there's a few things we're doing. We're trying to build the lived experience voice into everything that we do, to so every policy that we generate, everything that we change, we try and build that in. Two, uh, the chief inspector now of both probation and prisons is actively seeking a lived experience view so that when they feed back, they are feeding that, uh, that back. That's done in two ways. So there's a thing called an MQPL, so okay. measuring the quality of prison life. So when the inspector goes in, they also do that survey so that we can understand exactly what it feels like for yeah. the prisons. Makes a really big part of the inspector outcome, actually, in terms of whether prisoners feel safe, whether they've been assaulted, whether they've experienced racism, sexism, you know, anything of that kind. It's a really big part of the inspection feedback. And we do a uh, annual survey in probation, which is kind of let's get your view, let's have your say. Everyone on probation has an opportunity to feedback. Then the other really big thing we're doing, which I hope makes a big difference, back to your point about getting the DNA in the relationship, is we've committed to recruiting quite a big number of people with lived experience into the organisation. So they're actually doing jobs. They can feed it back in real time. They're doing a job like everyone else. So it becomes embedded. It doesn't become a particular thing that we go to an organisation to get a lived experience. It is part of our organisation. How, how open have like, um, you know, staff been to the lived experience element coming in? How, how how open have they been? Because, you know, 
I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm assuming that you know some of these lived experience people have been in prison themselves or exactly. on probation. So exactly. how well how have the staff taken to working with people so who I, have had the checkered past? I can honestly say from my direct experience, they've taken to it absolutely brilliantly and they love it. Our problem is not the reaction to people coming in. So there's a, a lady with lived experience who works in my direct office and she is brilliant. I mean, just a shout out, brilliant, and I love having her around. Um, the difficulty has been vetting. Okay. So we are still struggling with a system that is not set up for that kind of experience. So it's still too painful. It's too long. It requires kind of too many interventions from senior people. So, you know, it's the sort of process I might be able to eventually get through. But if a hiring manager was trying to do it back to that office in Cambran, it's difficult. It's still difficult to do. It'd be a difficult experience for the person applying because yeah. they'd have to fill in a lot of extra forms, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the bit we're trying to work on, making the process easier so that we can get a lot more people in. How much of a priority is that right now, really? It, like, it's, it's a good priority. Yeah? I mean, we've committed to it. We okay. have committed to it across government. We're also trying to encourage the rest of the civil service, so not just our bit and not just the Ministry of Justice, to do the same. Okay, cool. Um, I wanted to ask you um, something about, uh, you know, how, how you feel about uh, certain officers that may use their power in a negative way or um, maybe show favouritism. Do you... Do you think that that is a problem or do, do you understand that that is a problem or something that happens? So look, I would be completely naive if I thought in an organisation of our size, there weren't some problems in pockets with some people. But on the whole, and I really do believe this, I've got an exceptional staff who do a very challenging job every single day and they go to work to do the right thing. But we have to be, we understand that in both prisons and probation, there is a unique power dynamic that is mm -hmm. very unusual. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, actually physically locking people up and denying mm -hmm. them their liberty, or in probation, the ability to deny them mm -hmm. that liberty by recalling them to prison or taking them back to court. We, we have to understand every individual member of staff, every manager, that's a huge responsibility. It's a privilege. It's a responsibility. We, we talked about that training, about how we try to manage that responsibility. And we do know that the safest way to, to have prisoners is to have good relationships, back to what we're saying. But we also have to be very careful that anything that isn't right, that hasn't, that has happened, that mm -hmm. shouldn't happen, mm -hmm. that we have lots of ways of trying to correct that and trying to ensure that it can't happen again. So investigations, we, we also, uh, you know, we're, we're always trying to look out for anything that has happened that shouldn't. And we've got to be on the metal about that all the time. We've got to be on our guard for it. We've got to ensure that we can correct people's behaviour and make sure these are positive relationships. How, how does that happen then? So what is like the procedure for, for example, um, you know, something hasn't been done right or there's, there's an issue that needs to be resolved. What is the, what is the process for that? So let me talk you through the process, but there cool. are kind of a million ways. Let me just talk you through the process a minute from a kind of prisoner perspective, because cool. obviously it's slightly different yeah. depending on where you're on the system. From a prisoner perspective, there are complaint forms available internally everywhere. They should be printed in 20 different languages, so they should be accessible for everybody. You should be able to get help if for whatever reason people can't uh, read or, or write, then someone should be available to help them. That then goes in a complaint system. If you're not happy with the reply, you get an appeal process. Yes. If you're still not happy with that reply, you can go to the independent prisons and probation ombudsman. Yeah. You know, it doesn't come through me, it doesn't come via me. Right? That's the brown envelope. Yeah. There is also internally a confidential access system. So if you wanted to complain about a member of staff or a, a relationship you, you thought was difficult, you can write direct to the governor, only seen by the governor. They're right back to you. Same appeal, same PPO. What about then if you feel like from a prisoner perspective that the response you've got isn't the right course or, for example, there's conflicting, um, uh, a conflicting side from an officer perspective? Yeah. Uh, how do you weigh up that decision then? Yeah. So, I mean, just back to kind of the process. Yeah. So if you weren't happy, you'd do the appeal. If you still weren't happy, you'd go to the PPO. Yes. At any stage in that that we couldn't get to the bottom of it, we would do a proper investigation. Okay. Either a simple investigation or ask another member of staff to look at it. Sometimes things like CCTV can be helpful. Sometimes yes. there are other witnesses, et cetera. And the PPO do the same thing. So if they were to receive a complaint, they would do an investigation. So I just wanted to go, thank you for yeah, clarifying, clarifying that. that. <laughs> I just wanted to go back a tiny bit to, you know, uh, I completely understand that, 
you know, officers do have a role as well, you know, if something isn't good and isn't right and, you know, that can't, that can't happen. Um, and same for like, obviously uh, prisoners, they might feel that they are, that, that they're not, um, it's a power thing. Yeah. 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 Um, do you feel like, you know, I just feel, I feel like, and I know a lot of people in prison have felt like there, there are that just, if there is um, an officer that's using their power in a negative way, then, then those are just, you know, the bad eggs and they just, that just happens. And that just it is what it is. Because I feel like if it was, I don't know, in anything else or anywhere else like that, that kind of gets nipped in the bud and, and it's done in any kind of working environment. But this is something that kind of, it just happens and has happened for, for, for ages. Um, I just want to understand like maybe why, why that is and why that's a feeling that people in prison have. So look, let me just be really clear. No one should tolerate it. No one should accept it. Not me or not you. Uh -huh. So it shouldn't just be a thing that, you know, they're a bad egg. Okay. If there is someone who is abusing their power, isn't doing their job right, we want to deal with it. And we, uh -huh. we, we want that to change. And I think the vast majority of my staff out there want that to change. They want good relationships. It makes their working life safer. You know, occasionally we have uh, prison officers who do bad things like convey things into prison. So, you know, they might smuggle contraband items that makes it risky for every other member of staff it isn't just what it does it destabilizes nobody wants that nobody wants that bag egg and that's why we have all these processes and that's why we look at it but um to your point it is a really unique environment and what we need is for people to speak up and to have a dialogue and staff often come to me about things that aren't right not necessarily other members of staff but processes that mm -hmm. aren't right and they're often advocating for prisoners in that. They're not saying mm -hmm. it's not right for staff. They're saying, but we could be doing so much more and so much better and we could be helping people more. So it's often staff who come to me wanting to change things. We were going to ask you about that, but I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. So staff do regularly like voice concerns or, or suggestions to make improvements, things Very like that. Very regularly. Okay. And all the time since I've, from the, my time as being an officer, I started off at HMP Lewis right to this job, I have always had staff going to me saying, we could do this better, couldn't we? We could make that better. We could do this. The regime would be better. The outcomes would be better. I, I hear ideas from staff all of the time to make things better for prisoners and offenders and to get better outcomes. You are definitely right in the sense that it's a unique environment and there is already that, that power um, versus prisoner, let's say, which which creates that unique uh, environment. So uh, I, I understand why there's no um, uh, kind of like black and white theory about it. Um, what about suggestions from uh, prisoners and feedback uh, from prisoners? How uh, do you get feedback from prisoners and how, and how do you get it? And how is it implemented? So we get great feedback uh, from prisoners all the time. Uh, uh, one of the ways we talked, we talked a bit about it, haven't we? HMIP, so they do a full survey. Um, Majesty's Inspector of Prison when they go in that tells us a lot about how safe people feel what their experience has been like in that prison we get loads of feedback for example on regime activities you know how has the education service been for people yeah. how is attending workshops and then like I say people just write to me as well so there's loads of formal routes to get mm -hmm. it and there's loads of informal ways to get okay. it see with the inspect inspections like I've been I've been in my time in prison I've been around certain prisons when the inspectorate's around. Yeah. Sometimes you get like, you know, the, the prisoners that have got more of a voice or more vocal that they're not around when the inspectors are around or, you know, the inspectors are taken to different places within the prison. How do you make sure that, you know, a whole picture is received for, of the prison? Look, it's a really good question. What I would say, first of all, is that inspectorates are very, very experienced about what they do. So most of them have been doing it for a very great number of years. A fair few of the staff came from a background in prisons. Okay. They, they, they know the general life of prison. They get a feel for a prison really, really quickly, which is why I still think inspection is such a valuable tool. Um they do a load of things to check it. So there's a load of documents they check. There's the survey, which everyone has a chance to fill in confidentially. And then there's what they go and look at and go and see. But your point is sort of true in life generally, isn't it? There's always people who are more vocal and people who are less. Well, that's true of my staff group. There are certain people who are more vocal yeah. than others. And the challenge for all of us is trying to hear from everyone and trying to make sure you hear all the different voices. Yeah. I should also mention members of parliament are really active often on behalf of 
people in prison as well. So they will often write, they will often get involved in individual casework in either the community or in prisons. So there are lots of different avenues that people can explore if they feel, you know, that they're not being treated right. Um, I kind of wanted to move on to probation a little bit. Yeah, of course. Um, and I just wanted to ask you uh, to clarify um, what the what the main object of a probation officer are just yeah just to establish their role yeah of course look it's really straightforward it's the same as a prison officer it is to protect the public and reduce reoffending. so what a probation officer is trying to do all the time is make sure that offender is not a risk to anyone in the community either in general or specifically so a victim perhaps of a previous offense but also to try and get that person to lead a law-abiding life. So to try and get them a house, a job, employment, help with addiction, and to try and make sure they're on a path that means they don't come back to us. I think it's just sometimes, the reason why I asked the question is it's sometimes for somebody leaving prison and on probation, a bit confusing why, you know, they have a probation officer at times um, and all the things that, you know, you've listed that they should be able to help with uh, sometimes just isn't the case. Um are you going to touch? Yeah, so like, yeah, so like, <laughs> like Zach wants to say something. No, nah, because no, good, good point you're bringing up, Jules. Because you know, one of the criticisms that we have like heard uh, quite regularly is that you know, probation officers can't give the support that the systems claim that they should, um, which leaves the which leaves the the person on probation, the pops, um, feeling like they're just a tick box exercise. You know, just come in, how you doing? Duh, 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 this is what I need. Okay, sign post you there and eventually the outcome isn't what is basically promised on the tin, if that makes sense. I do. So look, can I talk you through a, a couple of things? So, I mean, first of all, as we talked about a lot, there is a real balance for a probation officer job because, mm -hmm. you know, you think about all the things you could do for money. I, I don't think people join probation because they don't want to help people. It is a massively vocational job. People join it in probation because they believe in second chances and they believe they can make a difference to people why they come to work, it's why they do a kind of really challenging job. But they do have to balance that helping with people with the risk they pose to others. And, you know, there's been quite a lot of talk about that on the, the news recently in, in terms of the risk that people pose and how we can try and manage that down. So they're always trying to balance those things. But then I think you're asking me, look, how can they practically help people? So can I just get into that? So let's talk about accommodation. Yeah. We've actually developed a system now where we've got three levels where we're trying to help people from accommodation and we call it CAS 1, 2 and 3. Okay. So CAS 1 is approved premises and that's normally for the higher risk individuals and only for people leaving prison, but you can stay there longer. We've got more approved premises beds. You go to it, some people call them a hostel, yeah. it's an approved premise. You go there, you do have to sign in an app. There's staff who can help you there 24 hours a day. We try and run a bit regime, try and practically help for move on accommodation, getting employment, doing what people need to do, like sign on to benefits, that kind of thing. Yeah. There's CAS 2, which you guys might have known as old fashioned as BIS, which is the bail information service, hmm. where we're trying to provide accommodation for people who would otherwise not be in prison if they had somewhere to live. So this might be HDC. So at the end of his sentence, coming out on home detention curfew with a yeah, tag, tag, but yeah. you haven't got a suitable address. You can't go to a family member's house or whatever. We try and provide this accommodation. Or at the front end, the court might have decided they would bail you, but you've got nowhere to go. Yeah, you've got no yeah, like fixed abode. Yeah. Exactly. No fixed abode or nowhere you can have a tag, for yeah. example. So they might bail with, you, with a tag, but you've got to have a home to have a tag. So we try and provide this service where we can give an alternative address that is safe and secure and therefore you don't have to be in custody. And then the third type, which is the one I really wanted to kind of get to for helping people, is CAS3. And it's a new system where we are trying to provide 84 com. 84 nights accommodation that we are buying and purchasing, we being HMPPS, for anyone who would otherwise leave prison homeless. Okay. So what I think people have to appreciate, which I know is difficult frustration, is I'm not a housing provider. The, the, ho the local authority should be providing housing. Yes. But what we have totally accepted and realised is that we've got to provide a bridge. So that is what CAS3 is for. It's buying 84 nights accommodation. At the end of that, there will be no accommodation. So what we're trying to do is use that 84 nights to get into the local authority system, to try and get the right referrals. But housing is tricky. You know, housing yeah, is tricky. Very... It is a difficult problem. But we're trying to buy that time so that people don't become homeless. They can instead come into our accommodation, 
use that time to get them into the local authority referrals, et cetera, and then hopefully get really stable move-on accommodation. Is this already rolled out? It's, it's rolled out in five regions. Okay. And by April, we'll start rolling out to the whole country. Do you know which country. regions is out? The, so, out I mean, I can give you all the detail, but by April, yeah. by the end of April, we're rolling it out everywhere. Okay, so we cool. find another lot of money this year and cool. it will be rolled out everywhere in England and Wales. I think that would be great. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I actually think that would be great. Um, because that is one, and as you'd probably know as well, it's one of the main reasons why people may fall off track when they get released, if they're homeless, because it uh, absolutely can send you backwards in it. So uh, um, the reason we focus so much on, on homelessness is because it's my view that it's a foundation. So if you also have an alcohol or substance misuse problem or a mental health problem, you can't really get help with that problem until you've got a dress. Yeah. Equally, you can't really get employment until you've got an address. You know, these are some of the basics. It's hard to even get a bank account without getting yeah. addressed and therefore it's hard yeah. to get universal credit so yeah. we really think that's a foundation and then from there you can build up all the other things i think just for yourself as well you know having that having that uh base for yourself is mentally yeah huge yeah uh do you think the relationship between uh people on probation and probation officers are somewhat strained or somewhat challenging Look, I guess it's not dissimilar from the conversation we've been having about prison officers, is it? In that there is a unique power dynamic and ultimately, let, you know, I don't want to be naive. You know, if you turn up to the probation office, that probation officer has the ability to say, you haven't been doing what you need to. Uh, therefore, you know, I'm either revoking your license, going back into custody or going back to court. So it, it, again, the power dynamic is a very unique one. But what I would say is, you know, there are lots of systems and processes we have to go through before we can activate one of those two things. We have yeah. to re elite, we have to reach a legal threshold uh, that is challenged in law about whether, for example, we can recall someone. And lots of people, chief inspectors, auditors, look at us to say whether those recalls are valid. Like, yeah. was it justified to recall that individual in those situations? And a lot of probation officers will really do everything they can to look for alternatives to recall. And to help people, ultimately, I come back to my first statement and I absolutely believe it with every fibre. I'm not being naive. Probation staff join probation to help people. Yeah. They don't join them to take them back to custody. What about, for example, like, because you mentioned recall and recall is a big subject, obviously, with yeah. people on probation and, and in prison. But like, for example, what if someone is recalled to prison once they've been arrested for something, but they haven't been charged or they uh, end up without a conviction for that arrest. Yeah. Why are they still left on recall in prison? So look, like, it's, a, it's a good question and one that often provides confusion. There are lots of different license conditions, some that are standard yes. and some that are unique to the individual. So an example of a standard one is to be of good behaviour, to turn up to your probation appointment. Everyone will have yeah. those. A unique one might be, for example, an exclusion zone. Yes. So you might have a particular victim, you're not allowed to enter yep. a central London or, you know, yep. whatever the exclusion zone is. So there's standard ones and then there's individual ones. And then reasons for the recall will have to be a breach of one of those license conditions, mm -hmm. right? So it could be as straightforward as you're wearing an electronic monitoring tag, you go into an exclusion zone. Boom. That is a straightforward violation. That's, yeah, that, I think everyone can understand yeah. that. Yeah, it could fair. be that you didn't turn up for excessive, successive probation appointments, uh, which is, would be a standard one, or it could be that you're accused of another crime. Yes. Uh, you might be, even if you're charged, it's subsequent that the charge might be dropped. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean the recall is over because the standard license was to be of good behavior. Mm -hmm. So there might have been lots of activity, even if ultimately you're not convicted of the yeah. crime, that means we are worried about the behavior. But there are lots of safeguards for people on probation too. Okay. Like it has to meet a legal threshold for us to recall people. And then it has to be reviewed both by us, separate from the probation officer who recalled you, mm -hmm. so a totally different central unit okay. called public protection unit. But then also, depending on your sentence, quite often it will have to be reviewed by the parole board as well. Yeah. So if you were released on parole and you're recalled, the parole board will review, totally separate again from me and HMPPS, yeah. whether or not that recall was legitimate or fair. And then, but so then, so for example, then, because then I've just got to speak from this perspective, because that, that makes it clearer picture on the process from that side. But for example, for the person that hasn't committed an offence, then... By the letter of the law, they're not guilty of the whatever they got That's right. arrested for. Why are they being punished then if they're 
st- been recalled, for example, if they weren't on licence, they wouldn't be in prison. No, you're right. So, so first of all, we just need to be clear, though, that a licence doesn't mean that, that they are being punished or not punished. It is a part of the original of sentence. Of course, yes, without a doubt. That's clear. Let's make that clear. So yes. let's say you got eight years. And you did four years. Four years in prison. Four of the years is subject to licence, exactly, without a doubt. Exactly. So the punishment yeah. is already set by the court. Cool. If you say, we don't set the punishment, it's yes. set by the court. The question is whether you're serving it in the community or not, or, in or whether prison, you're without a doubt. back in prison. And I go back to the example I've given. It isn't just straightforwardly about whether you're convicted of the crime. Mm-hmm. It's also about whether there was good behaviour. So for example, yeah. for example, someone might be, their original offence might have been drug related. Yeah. Then they're out on licence and then they might have been picked up for possession. For lots of reasons, they might not get convicted of that possession, but they might have already admitted to the probation officer they started taking drugs again mm-hmm. or, 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 you know, dealing yeah, yeah, yeah. or intent to supply. Yeah. But they might not have convicted of that crime, but they might have started saying, yeah, I've taken drugs, or they might have been found that they came up positive on a drug yeah. test, all of which would mean the, le- the recall was legitimate, despite the fact they yes. hadn't actually been convicted of the crime. What about if those things weren't happening and those weren't the case? So yeah. they've been, uh, yeah. They've so, been, it's a, so it's a totally different yeah, area. Like, for example, they were accused, they were pre- they, previously yeah. went in for drugs. Yeah. Now it's like a robbery. For or, 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 yeah. or they've been accused of um, of drugs and the, yeah. they haven't done anything wrong. So if what was, happens then? Do they get recalled? So, so let, I think what would happen in that scenario is they would have already been recalled because we wouldn't know the police were going to drop the charges, for yeah. example. Then at some point during that period of recall, the police decide to drop the charges. So then there's lots of avenues that they can go down. They could ask for the parole board to review mm-hmm. their recall, but it is the parole board if you are out on parole. But they're if already you're in prison. Release. They're already back in prison. Yeah. That, I think that's where it's... That, that, I think that's yeah. where the... Why are they automatically put back in prison before when isn't those... it innocent before proven guilty? No, because... In that sense, why is there not... Well, no, I I genuinely don't think that's right in this sense because it's back to my point. They're already serving a sentence. Okay. And one of the parameters of that sentence is to be of good behaviour. Yeah. And if there is something that's called that into question, including being charged with a crime by the police, we would have to, the actual test we have to go through, right, is not the individual and the punishment. Mm. It's whether or not that individual represents a risk to society. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. So I understand why now. Um, yeah, that makes it clearer. It makes it clearer whether I'm like I. I obviously I still feel like there's um, still feel a, like- unfair unfairness just because of of that person. You know, they've been given back a little bit more of their freedom. They're trying to get back on a really good path, and you know they're doing really well. And they've been accused. I'm just saying hypothetically, this yeah. could be like the wor- like the worst case or whatever. They've been accused of something. They're back inside, which they've you know they've just overcome. Yeah, to to find themselves you know innocent of that of that thing, I think is, I don't know, I think it's quite a, quite a lot to, to go through. I do understand, like, if you're saying to me that recall is a massive event and an offender can really set them back, we totally understand that, yeah. which is again why I say we really test ourselves on the legal threshold that is tested by a lot of other people for recalling someone in the first place. We also are very aware of the welfare impacts when people come un- into prison on a recall, so the suicide and self-harm, you know, trying to help them manage them through that. And then like I said, there are lots of avenues of appeal, if you mm. like, for people mm. who have been recalled to lots of independent people from us, whether it's fair, whether they can be re-rele- re-released, et cetera. Is that, is that actually, is that decision up to you? Like, have you, can you put input into that decision being changed? You know, that, that law um, or the process of the it. process of it. So we absolutely into put into process. I mean, it depends exactly what which the process you mean because if it's decision of our staff and it's the if it's the looking at it by the PPG, so that's the public protection group. That is absolutely all within H and PPS. Okay. The parole board is very separate, yeah, yeah. but it's statutorily by law independent. Yeah. So I wouldn't get involved in that process. So it it it, dep- it depends which part, but we deliberately build it so that not all the processes are with me and my organisation so that there is fairness for everybody. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just, just quickly. Sorry, Zach. Um, just before we move off of license, I just had one question about, um, um, why, why are people in prison not allowed to see their license conditions until they're released? I don't know whether it's something that you always hear, or you've heard so much. Um, but I just wanted to kind of, uh, clarify that. That tends to be the case. You find out on release what your license conditions are. Okay. After, yeah. 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 So, so a few things. 
absolutely by process, every single person on the gate at the time they're getting their discharge, discharge grant or whatever monies they're getting and their, you know, mm-hmm. whatever property they came yeah, yeah. in with, they should also get their license. If they're on license, they should get their license conditions. Mm-hmm. Nobody should be allowed to be discharged until they've signed the license mm-hmm. conditions. And we have to then make sure. So that's our kind of legal proof that we've told everyone yeah. what their license conditions are. And that happens on the day at release so that, you know, when you walk out of the prison, you should have that sheet of paper physically in your hand. I think what you guys are asking, which is a really good question is, look, why don't people get a bit of notice? Why don't they know yes. before? So look, a, a few things. One, the standard license conditions are the same for absolutely everybody. Mm-hmm. So to be of good behaviour, to turn up yeah. uh, to probation appointments, etc. Then it's the individual ones, the ones that I referred to, like having an exclusion zone that there might be uh, to reside at a named address. For example, sometimes both those things take us quite a long time to work out. So it might be that probation officers have to check an address property, so check that it's suitable for them to go there. Sometimes that with, for example, release on home detention curfew when you have a tag, that, that might only happen, you know, a little bit of time before so that there hasn't been time to advise the individual. Sometimes it's that victims themselves can input into those license conditions, particularly on things yeah, like that, exclusion, exclusion zones, yeah. etc. So, I mean, the answer to the question is, our aim would be genuinely to give people as much possible notice if they can. We're not trying to catch people out. We're trying to get them to stick to those license conditions. But sometimes very practical things just mean you do, you didn't you don't get all the full advantage advance notice that you would want. I I completely get that, and it must be quite detailed. Everyone's very individual. I just I just think like how is it for everybody it's always to the last day that that those get done surely i don't know there must be is there something being put in place to have these license conditions you know earlier um because even myself i sat in there for ages worrying and stressing and you know just trying to plan but you can't plan like that i think that's one of the the, the hardest things I- I trying do, to plan but you can't i do genuinely understand that i, I really think it's a do. massive part yeah, yeah. I, and and the worry and the stress that that causes people. The thing we are really trying to do mm-hmm. is it's a little bit technical, but I'll try and explain why it's important, is we're trying to bring back the handover between the people who've looked after you in custody and the people who are going to look after you in the community yes. earlier into the sentence. So we call it the com and the pom. So it's, it's all yeah. a bit technical, but, but you know, there's the people who look after you in prison and there's people who look after the community. What we're trying to do is make that earlier, make that handover earlier, which should give you a much clearer, earlier sight of the things you're talking about. So it should help. But I'm not going to say that even with that, even if we made sure that seven and a half months before on a, uh, on a reasonable length sentence, you were talking to the people who's going to look after you in the community, yeah. I'm not going to promise that that would always mean that you would have your very early warning of your license conditions. Because like I say, sometimes it involves victims processes. If you're going through the parole board, you have to have the parole parole hearing before we actually get the license conditions set by parole. So there's just a lot of process and sometimes it takes time. But I completely agree with you that the more time we can give people, because what we want is for people to comply with their license. We don't want people to fail. What are you most proud of? Um... Since coming into this role, what are you most proud of, of HMPPS? So honestly, that is a really easy question to us. I am most proud of the staff who managed to change people's lives. And very occasionally people write to me with these brilliant stories. And I can be having a really difficult week, month or whatever. One of these stories is enough for me to think this is all worth it. So I'll tell you a little story. Last time I did a podcast, in fact, I did it in Wales in a... In Cardiff, we set up a thing called Grand Avenues, which if you haven't done a podcast on, you might really want to. So we are trying to help people on release from prisons and people on probation get involved in their community instead of having to go separately to the job centre, to their social work or whatever. It's all in one place, in this case, in a community hall as part of a church. So we bring everyone together. But what they found is more than being able to access services easily, they found a real community with each other, a real support network, which is often very difficult for people leaving prison. Anyway, two brilliant people, just like yourselves, uh, sat on a sofa and did an interview with me. And we were talking about a very similar thing. And I said to them, so, you know, what's been your greatest achievement since, uh, since you left prison? And he looked straight in his eyes. And, and the guy who had been helping him to learn the podcast skills, eyes filled with tears as the minute this chap started talking. And he said, my mum's just proud of me. She's never been proud of me, really, my whole life, because I've always been 
doing things yeah. I shouldn't and making her not proud. And now she's proud. And I mean, you can see now I'm still having an emotional reaction yeah. now. Uh, that, that is it. That, that, that is what I turn up to work for. Yeah, no, that, I feel that. I feel that definitely. And I think the thing that that story really shows as well is, you know, the old story about throwing a pebble into a pond. It isn't just the life of that person. He will have had an impact on his mum, on his sister, on his children, and all of their lives are better because he's leaving a better life, not not just his life. I couldn't agree more. <clears throat> Definitely affects the the wider the the wider people around you know the family um, and everyone around them. Um, okay, so what about your plans? Um, what is you know what what can what do you think can be improved, and what are your plans to work on things? What's what's going to happen? Great question. So, so look, first of all, I think we've sort of said this throughout the interview. My real priority is that everything is in the support of the staff helping people on the front line. So I want to make life as good and as easy as possible as I can for probation staff and for prison staff. That means recruiting more people because we don't have quite enough staff at the moment. It means training them as well as we can to lots of the questions that we've asked. And it means being absolutely crystal clear that that's what we want, the best outcomes that we can get for people, building on relationships, building on practical things like accommodation. So we want to help those people protect the public, reduce reoffending. That That is really at the heart of our mission. That is what we want to do. And then we want to do some strategic things. So I have an ambition to build new modern fit for purpose prisons that have uh, better kind of access For probation, we want to make sure we train people as well as we can, get the right number of staff in, as we've talked about, have modern fit for purpose buildings and give them all the tools to your question that they need to help people. So that is building on things like accommodation. It's employment. It's getting the right connection with other government agencies to things like uh, help with mental health, help with drugs uh, and alcohol addiction. So it is absolutely the heart of our mission is to reduce reoffending and protect the public. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, so what we like to do on Life After Prison is name some organisations that can really help people that have been affected by the criminal justice system. So today we are mentioning Clinks. They have many organisations uh, on their site. You can find um, local ones to you as well. So you can use the Clinks directory to find these. We also have Prisoners Families Helpline. Um, the They are run by PACT and they have a free phone for England and Wales. The phone number is 0808 808 2003 and they offer support for families who have a loved one uh in the criminal justice system um also the longford trust so they offer scholarships and awards for young people in prison and people that are newly released to continue their rehabilitation through education you can sh- you can find all of these in our show notes so definitely check them out yeah please do uh, as we do on life after prison um we like to share your messages from you and today we have one from Sasha and actually it's a question for you Jules Um, and this came in from Instagram Uh, Sasha says I have a question for Jules I'm working with a client at the moment um, who wants to become a PT he still has unspent convictions um, and he's still on probation I was wondering if you had any advice as to what route you took to become a PT and if you found your conviction to be a barrier um, okay, great questions. Um, first of all, well done for getting your PT and getting released and, you know, being out in society um, and, and trying to use that. Um, so first of all, I'd say don't let that be a barrier. Um, you are in society. You are qualified um, just as everybody else is trying to get the same job as you. So, you know, be confident in that and don't let that be a barrier. Um I'd say, so for me, I was quite, um, I want to say lucky, but, you know, privileged in the fact that my employer didn't judge me on the fact that I had been to prison. Um, So as far as disclosing is concerned, I would, um, I would go by the vibe and the feeling of the employer um, and only disclose, you know, if you have to, or if you want to, um, for me, it worked in my favor to disclose and, you know, it, it really helped in that way. Um, 
but yeah, you know, uh, be confident. Go for um, go for it, and if you get knocked back, just keep 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 trying because somebody will somebody will take you on, and then you know that door's then open. So yeah, good luck. Yeah, good you got luck. this. And we touch on this more in uh, the episode that of me and Jules um, on the sit down call. Did you ever think you'd go to prison? We speak about that more, and in our other series, getting out, we also talk about. How to Disclose Your Offence, where we spoke to Debbie from Unlock. So check that out if you need some more advice. So if you want to get in touch, please do. You can DM us on Instagram or Twitter at After Prison Pod. Um, or you can send us an email at podcast at prison.radio. You can even write to us at Life After Prison, National Prison Radio, HMP Brixton, London, SW25XF. We also do have a website, so please contact us on there um, at lifeafterprisonpod.com. On that note, uh, I'd like to thank you for taking time out to speak to us. Uh, thank to everyone listening. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe, all of that good stuff. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>